Hey fellas, Meat Trapper here. I've had uh, a lot of questions recently about knives and what knives I use when I'm in the field and what knives I use when I skin my uh, critters. So I thought I'd do a, a little video on that and tell you the knives that I use, sort of how I came to the conclusions that I did, um, and also some knives that I don't like and why. One of my favorite knives is a Knives of Alaska Cub Bear. Um, this knife is 440C. They make a D2 version, but uh, this is a great, great knife. Uh, it's got a good sure grip handle on it. It's got a really big lanyard hole. Um, it fits the hand nice. It's got um, uh, a good choil. You can get your finger up on it to do detailed work. It's got a nice point that you can use for your opening cut. It's got some belly on it so you can do some skinning. Um, it's got a flat portion here, a flat grind that um, uh, you can use for a ringing cut. Now this knife, even though it's a small knife, I can do an entire whitetail deer with this, not a problem. Um, this, is, this is probably the knife that I use most often when I'm working on small game or um, skinning beavers or what have you. It comes with a nice sheath, and you can see this isn't uh, a quick draw combat sheath or anything. This is a protect your knife in the woods. Don't let it fall out. Don't let it get lost. Um, these are made in the United States. The sheath is made in the United States. And uh, this is probably my single most favorite go-to knife. Number two, and everybody is going to know what this is, a buck 110. It's a folding knife. This is a, a bigger knife. You can com, you can compare it to the Cub Bear. So the buck is a, a bigger knife. It's a substantial knife. It's heavy. It's well made. Um, it's also a stainless blade. It takes a great edge. Made in America. And this is just a classic knife. Um, if you've never owned one or you don't have one, you need to go get you one and, and you will immediately fall in love with it. When it goes to a bigger game like a white-tailed deer, this is the knife that I carry. If I'm going trapping, I carry this knife. If I'm going deer hunting, I carry this knife. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit sturdier. You can really uh, reach up in the, uh, in the chest cavity and get into the esophagus and cut what you need. Uh, you've got more reach on it. Uh, it's got a good point for the opening cut, good belly for skinning, and uh, you can make your ringing cuts. And, um, I mean, what else can you say? This is, uh, this is an American classic. Now this knife is um, a surprising little knife. This is a Kershaw right here, and this, um, I think this is a 1080 orange. I like uh, brightly colored handles, orange handles. Um, if you set this down in the uh, leaves, uh, it's easy to see. And this is a, a beautiful little skinning knife. Now, I would not use this to make an opening cut. Uh, I don't use it to make ringing cuts, but when it comes time to uh, peel that hide back, this is a, a great little knife. It fits the hand well. It holds a pretty good edge. It's just light. It's compact, and it gets the job done. And we'll uh, we'll look at that more when we start skinning this beaver here. Now this is a Knives of Alaska knife that I really had high hopes for, and it simply hasn't lived up to my expectations. Um, this is called the Muskrat, and you can see. Um, this has a, a rounded tip, um, it's sharpened on the top on the false edge, fits the hand real well, and when I bought this knife I thought this would be a great skinning knife. Um, you're not going to poke any holes in the hide, you know, it doesn't have a tip on it. And I never use this knife. And the reason why is it doesn't have any belly on it, um, which means you're either going to cut straight or you're actually on the tip and you, when you get on that tip you don't have a lot of surface area exposed yeah it's rounded but it's not it's not rounded and blunt like an ulu and if you compare it to the amount of belly on this skinning knife when i go to skin i've got a lot of surface area that i can use when i go to skin with this there is not that much surface area so I really had high hopes for this knife, and uh, it just hasn't—it just hasn't worked out for me. Um, a lot of people like it, 
but I don't. The last thing is touching up. When you've got a pile of beavers, when you've got seven, eight, nine, ten beavers lined up, you're going to have to touch your knives up. Uh, a lot of people use crock sticks. If you can ever find an original Gerber home steel, uh, this, this thing is worth its weight in gold. This will last you the rest of your life. Uh, basically, you just use it to, uh, it's, what you're doing is when your edge starts to roll, you're taking, you're taking the roll out of your edge. You use it the same way you would use a strop, it's just it's going to line your edge back up for you. And this is a great way to touch up a blade. Um, also, I put some uh, compound on the back so that I use it as a leather strop as well. So this is um, this thing is one of my most valuable possessions when it comes to knives and they're really hard to find. Uh, I think all the ones that, that are made today are made in China but um, if you can find an older made in America one this is a good deal. So let's um, get to work. Let's start skinning this beaver and as I skin it I'm going to show you uh, some of the points that I was talking about and you'll get to see it in action. Now once I've got the legs off, what I want to do is to make it easier when I'm skinning this beaver, I want to get this blade up inside and sort of start ringing around like that. That's going to make it a lot easier to find this leg hole without cutting the pelt. And so to do that, I want a blade that's shaped like this. I want a good point on it so it will go in and penetrate. I don't want a fat, thick blade. I want a narrow blade so that I can go around like that. And you can see that will fit right up in there and let me ring right around that tail. I can flip it over and go back the other way just like that. And it's hard for me to get an angle since I'm trying to avoid the camera but this way you can see I've loosened that up so that when I start skinning down it's going to come right off. And I'll do the same thing on the other leg and a little bit around here as well as the front feet. Now that I've made my opening cut using the cub bear, now it's time to actually start skinning the animal and I want you to see how the different blade styles will fit in here and what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Now I can use this cub bear but you can see it doesn't really have a lot of belly on it and so I'm I'm trying to make a draw cut basically like that and that'll work I mean you can do it but compare the belly with this skinning knife and you can see this thing just I mean this is exactly what this knife is built for it just you, you can basically push it push it in there and you can see how much surface area how much contact I have with that and this is more of a draw cut so I can take this, get my finger on it, and just start start skinning away. It's very easy to control, fits in the hand well. I really like this little this little skinning knife. Now if we look at the muskrat right here, to do what I've been doing with the with the other knife, see, that just doesn't that just doesn't work as well. Look how little surface area I have in contact. Look how little of a of a cutting surface I have. I have to lay it almost flat. And that's this you can see this is by far the worst choice. The cub bear is a lot better choice for getting contact and in, and when you're actually skinning this is my preferred skinning knife right here this little Kershaw. Okay now that the animal's skinned first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the back straps out so I'm going to make a cut right down each side of the spine and to do that I'm going to want to use my cub bear I'll start at the base the skull. And you can see I'm getting that point down in there and I'm just going to ride right along the edge of that spine. The 
See, I like this because it's a thin blade, and I can get down. I can get down deep in there. I can get down between the front shoulder, and I can separate that front shoulder from the back strap and get all of it. I can really get down as far as I need. Then I can sever the top of that back strap and start pulling it out. And by using this sharp tip, narrow knife, I don't I don't miss anything. I'm getting everything. Now another common task is basically disjoining the animal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to take this hind quarter off. And you can see I'm not gutting the animal. You can also see I haven't removed the casters. I haven't fooled with any of that. I don't I don't want to touch that until after I've got all the meat off that I'm going to take. Now the key to disjoining the hind quarter is to find the ball and the socket down in there and then there's a single ligament or a tendon that holds it together and by using this once again this narrow blade where I can reach in there with a really sharp point I can pop that tendon and pull the whole thing off in one piece. Hopefully, you can see this. But it's right there. And you can actually see that opening. And that is in that ball and socket joint. And I'm going to cut that tendon and pop that joint. right there that's it you can see that's free and that's that tendon right there and this this tip makes it easy to get in there and get it one of the last things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the uh, what I call the cheek meat everybody knows beavers like to chew they're good at it and there is a little nugget of meat right here that is uh, something that you don't want to waste. Once again, I'm using that, that blade to get down in there, scrape it out right along the bone, making sure I get everything. Because even though I use the gutless method and I don't open them up, I don't gut them, I like to get all the meat that I can. I don't like to waste anything if, if possible. So I hope that was uh, useful. Um, you can see these two knives are the ones that I use most often and I can pretty much do anything I need um, to do with them and do it efficiently and uh, do it easily. So uh, it'll be time to touch them up now and uh, um, run a tough cloth over them, get some uh, protection on them. While I'm at it, uh, it'll be time to clean up the uh, pistol. You can see uh, I've removed the grips from this Ruger. Um, I'm in the mud so much, and my gloves are muddy, um, my hands are muddy, um, everything is muddy. There's no way that I uh, can keep a, a, a weapon clean. So this is what it looks like when I come out of the woods. Um, and by removing the grips it just makes it that much easier to clean and I don't have to worry about stuff rusting under there so I just keep this keep this removed all the time uh, another trapper showed me that and I was sort of skeptical at first but when I went ahead and did that it has saved me a lot of time and it's very easy to just uh, spray it out with uh, gun lube whatever you want to use um, and wipe it out and you can see exactly what's going on under there so uh, anyway, you got to take care of your gear, and your gear will take care of you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later.